Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you, Gene. It's great to have everybody here this morning and to hear that hum of people visiting and enjoying each other's company. Welcome to our morning worship services here at 1905 West Pearl, Granbury Church of Christ. We are tickled that you're here, especially if you're visiting with us. If you're a visitor, you our honored guest. Also, we have quite a few people streaming with us this morning, and we want to welcome you if you're streaming. It doesn't matter if you're across the street, across the nation, across the world. We're glad you're here. So, as we begin our worship and song this morning, let's stand as we sing. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, for my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams. With my heart is God, you are the Lord, God of all I am. Won't you reign? stood up here for the first time and I think I've been here well I've been here 25 years I know the Knoxes have been here 17 years and the very first time I walk up here and I had never seen this before in any of the times that I've ever gotten up here to speak not one time Jan Knox is sitting in the audience <laughs> I have never seen that before so welcome <laughs> As Brent said this morning, we want to welcome everyone, whether you're a member or you're one of our honored guests. And so if you would at this time, uh, if you will take that flap that's on the back of your announcement sheet 
If you don't mind filling that out and then tear it off and leave it in that seat, and, uh, we will pick those up sometime this week. Also, if you've never been with us before, our communion is in the little goblets, if you will, in the tray under the seat in front of you. So if you want to go ahead and get those, you'll be ready for when we serve our communion. This past week, 13 of our children's ministry kids participated in Mission Camp. It's a service-oriented camp hosted by GCOC. Each day, the children studied about what it means to have a servant's heart. Then they found small ways to become a servant within our community. As part of the event, our kids visited Mission Granbury. They learned what services Mission Granbury provides to our community and helped pack weekend bags for children in need. During their visit, they learned that there are a few basic items that Mission Granbury has a constant need for and an insufficient supply of shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. In keeping with having a servant's heart, our kids have decided to host a shampoo, conditioner, and body wash drive. If you're able, please consider donating one of these items to their cause. Donation bins will be placed in the gym and near the front of the entrance in the building and will be collected through August 1st. If you have any questions, you can contact Marlita Wyndham. It is such a privilege and honor to be here this morning. During the pandemic, when we were unable to come together, we often wondered if things would ever get back to what we knew as normal. And it seemed like at every turn, Satan would take a, a, a try at trying to make us even more fearful. Even today, vaccine, no vaccine, mask, no mask. I pray that we are never fearful of serving our Lord. And I pray that each one of us today will come together and lift our hearts unified and calling on Jesus as our Lord and our merciful God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Father, this truly is the day that you have made. And Father, we pray that as we come together that we worship you in song and in scripture and in study. And Father, we pray that you accept our worship. And Father, we pray that as we leave here today, that we will glorify your name throughout the rest of this week. Father, let us be that light that you have called us to be. Father, thank you for calling us your children. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, that's not good. At this time, we uh, will turn our thoughts to the cross and the focus that we should have uh, as we consider Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and the sacrifice that he made for each of us. So as we do that, we'll be singing, As the Deer Pants for Water. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you.
Morning, church family. Good to see everybody this morning. I'm going to ask everybody to do something this morning that may be a little hard. All those of you who have children, raise your hand. Everybody, pretty much everybody, right? Didn't know if y'all could raise your hands or not. All those of you who have sons, continue raising your hand. All those of you who have sons and would give him up to save my life, keep your hands raised. <laughs> Funny, yes. Jesus Christ did. I laid his life down for all of you. And God gave his one and only son life for all of us. Put that in perspective. I've got two boys and I couldn't do that. I know many men and women go off to war and they lay their lives down for our freedoms, but I don't know that any of us parents would willingly give our sons up to save someone else. Let's keep that in perspective. Father God, thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son, your one and only son, so that I might hope, have hope of eternal life with you. Help us keep that in perspective as we live out our lives and hopefully honor you each and every day that we do. In your son's name I pray, amen. continue in prayer. Father God, we want to continue to honor your sacrifice for the blood that your son shed on that cross that redeems us and saves us and brings us to you. Thank you for your sacrifice and for his sacrifice for our lives. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
You know, the Bible references money some 2,000 times in the Bible. So I think God think it was a pretty important, pretty important thing for uh, to have lessons on on money. Uh, you know, we we take this part of our service to give back, and there's many ways we can do that now. We don't pass the plates anymore, but we have the offering boxes spread, uh, scattered around the exits uh, for your checks, or you can you can give online. Or uh, this church does many great and wonderful things, but they can't do it without our support. We had an elder in in the valley that uh, made a comment one time that says, we can cover all the needs of this community, of this church, of our renovation. We can cover it all. It's right here in this auditorium. Problem is, it's in our pockets. So if you have the opportunity and you are able, give of your means, of your first fruits. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for how, how you've blessed us. You've blessed us in so many amazing ways. And thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our blessings with you through this church. And through this church, we're able to take our small means, our small givings to you. And they go out, not only in this community, but throughout the world to bring more souls to Christ. Help us to be cheerful givers and willing givers and give as we are able. In your name I pray, amen. A couple of weeks ago on July 4th, we celebrated Independence Day. Uh, that was 245 years since Thomas Jefferson penned what we call the Declaration of Independence. And probably one of the most important, or at least the most recognized sentences in that Declaration of Independence is in the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 245 years ago in the United States, as it was becoming the United States, people were coming from England where if their life was meaningless, it could be taken from them. They were under suppression, which goes into their liberty. They had no freedoms. All of their freedoms came from whoever they worked for, which led to the last one, the pursuit of happiness. That pursuit of happiness came from the ownership of property because it was felt that unless you were going to be truly happy, you had to be able to own the property that you worked on. That everything on that property that you worked for was yours. And so that pursuit of happiness was the ability to own land to make it produce for yourself. What a twisted way from where we have that today, is it not? 
We have taken that pursuit of happiness to mean that I am free, I am capable of doing and chasing after whatever at that moment makes me happy. Whatever makes me feel good, then that's what I'm going to do. And no one can take that right from me, even if it goes against the grain of all humanity. Because I have that right. And here we are. We perpetuate that. We don't want to offend them and say that they're not correct. We don't want to just offend them and say, you know, the Declaration of Independence really doesn't say that. That's not what it was intended. That's not what it was meant. And we do the same thing for the Bible. We take our scriptures and we look at those scriptures and we say, well, you know, those don't really mean that today. Those verses don't really pertain to us because we've, we're changed. We're different. And so we pick and choose what scriptures make us feel good. And we pick and choose whatever lifestyle we may want. And then everyone else is just supposed to say, okay. Because somewhere along the line, we've changed the rules. We've decided that everything must be fair. Everything must be equal. Growing up, I had two younger sisters, five and six years younger than I am. We had chores. My chore was mowing the grass. I hate mowing the grass. My younger sisters were to do the dishes. And you can go to my family gatherings today And we won't talk about how old my younger sisters are, but if there's a family meal and it comes time for to do the dishes, I promise you they are going to argue about who's going to do them. One will say, I cooked, so I brought this stuff. I don't want to do it. And they will argue about what is fair because we want everything to be fair. They didn't think it was fair that I only had to mow the grass because it only needed it twice a week. They had to do dishes every night. Is life supposed to be fair? Is life supposed to be equal? According to society, yes. If we were going to do this, so when I was turned 50 years old, um, some guys buy cars. I went and bought a guitar. I wanted to play the guitar bad. And I thought, man, I'm 50 years old. I am going to play the guitar. So I researched it. I went out and looked to find the guitar that I wanted, and I found one and a very nice guitar. I went out and had drove all the way over to Grapevine and to a little music shop where I found this guitar that I just knew was going to be awesome. And I bought it. And I came back. And I started trying to play it a little bit. I took some lessons, bought some books, I got the videos, I did all this kind of stuff. And I started figuring out really quick that I have very large hands, but I have very short and very fat fingers. Okay? Well, when you're playing guitar, it makes it really hard to get short fat fingers to stick on the string without touching the other. You get string buzz. And I got string and fret buzz all the time. So it was very frustrating because I couldn't get that stretch. So what do you do when you find that? Well, you research it some more and you go buy another guitar. (laughs) (laughs) So I bought another guitar And while I'm playing with that, guess what? I still get the same thing. I can't get my fingers in between the strings. 
Well, if I was going to play by society's rules today, what I would do then is I should be able to hire an attorney and that I would sue all guitar manufacturers for not making the neck wider and the strings further apart because they are robbing me of my dream of being a guitar hero. And we laugh. But is that not what we're doing? Everybody doesn't get to do everything they want to. And we don't have to make excuses. My excuse was I have fat fingers. It's not an excuse. It's just the way I am. Many of y'all know I spent a, several years working with Ian Poulter, um, golfer on the uh, PGA Tour. When I was working for him, he was ranked ninth in the world. And I was his brand manager for the United States. And it, it afforded me some abilities to go do some things that were really cool. Intimidating, but really cool. And there was one time I had left on a Monday night, flew to London, got there on Tuesday morning, drove, I was picked up in a car, drove straight to sales meetings, was in sales meetings all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, and then went to play golf with Ian, his sales manager, which was off the European tour, and his, Ian's brother, whom Ian will tell you he has never beaten playing golf. And there's me. It's pretty intimidating. There's a saying that if you want a man's character, take him to play golf and see what comes out. Well, we're playing golf, and of course they're playing extremely well, and, I, and I'm playing not. Um, and I let my temper get the best of me, and after a... a horrible tee shot, I slammed my club on the ground. I was angry. And I told him, I mean, I don't know what the deal is. I have no idea what's happening. I guess I'm just jet lagged. I guess I'm just exhausted from the flight over here. I guess my knee, I can't post up on my knee. It's, it's buckling. I, I guess I'm sore from being on the plane. And Ian says, Hackers, would you like me to tell you what's wrong? I'm like, yes. I'm going to get a golf lesson from the ninth ranked player in the world. This is what I've needed. Ian is going to help me. And he looks at me and says, I can fix everything for you. I said, great. He said, your problem is you're not very good. <laughs> I did the same thing. I paused for a minute and I started laughing. I'm not very good based on them. I can tell you that since that time, I have not lost my temper on the golf course. I just, it always comes back to me, you're not very good. What is it? We want to make excuses when maybe we're just not very good. Benjamin Franklin said this, he is good at making excuses, is rarely good at anything else. And how true is that? So we are not created equal. And it's not about how we can possibly make things fair it's about how are we going to deal with the hand that we've been dealt? What are we going to do with those attributes that are God-given? Let's read Matthew 25. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work 
and gained five bags more. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever is given more, and they will have, abund have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's read verse 15. I want you to particularly pay attention to the end of that where it says, Each according to his own ability. See, the master knew that he had the three servants and they weren't the same. They were not equal. They had different talents. And their level and ability was not shared across the board. And so he gave them one five, and we know these five bag people. We, we run across five bag people all the time. They're good looking, they can speak, they, they're well educated, their parents have made sure that they have done and succeeded and never had to face failure. They're loved by everyone, admired, and they walk through life seemingly unscathed. We don't like those people. Those people are frustrating. And yet all five bag people don't use their bags accordingly. How easy is it for five bag people to say, you know what? I worked hard for my bags. These are my bags. And not done anything with them. And then we have our one bag people that are just never have the gift. They just don't get it. They're different. Life hasn't been kind to them. As Mike Blevins and I have said on many times, they're the people that didn't pick their parents very well. They start out with very little, if anything, but they have a bag. They have an ability. They have an opportunity to either use it or become timid and hide it. And then there's the most of the rest of us, the two-bag folks. 
We've got some talent. It's not an abundance of talent, but we're quite capable of being able to survive in a dog-eat-dog world. We can go day to day, and we can make a fine living, and we can go through life just plodding along. How many times do we waste that? How many times do we say, you know, I'd like to be able to do that, but he's so much better than I am. They do so much more. And so I'm a two-bag person. I don't even have to try that hard and be a two-bag person. So I'm going to sit back and kind of let everybody else take charge. And we waste what little that we have. We don't express ourselves. Verse 19 of that verse is the one that kind of should wake us all up. It says, after a long time, the master came home to settle his accounts. We live in a world today, we live in a culture at least, that has decided that there will be no settling of accounts that pretty much we can do whatever we want because the government says so. The government has said, you can decide what you want to be. It doesn't matter what God said you are. If you don't want to be this, you don't have to be. big thing right now is if you don't want to be a male athlete, well, go be a female athlete. Maybe you'll do better. How twisted we've become. I grew up in hearing saying that God doesn't make mistakes. I truly believe that. Each one of us are put here on earth with our own unique talents. We have our own unique abilities. It doesn't matter who your parents are or were. It doesn't matter what schools that you went to or are going to. It doesn't matter what teachers you have at those schools while they can give you the tools necessary to increase your talents, they are not the ones giving you your talents. Those are given by God. And one day, because it's true, because the Scripture says it's true, one day, we are going to be held accountable. One day, the master will return to see what you have done with your talents. One day, I'm going to be questioned about, Mark, we know you're a lousy golfer, but what else did you do? One day, I'm going to have to answer we all will have to answer a declaration of independence will not do you any good on that day and so I pray that every day we wake up and we thank God for whatever talents that we may have whatever abilities that we may have because every one of those is an opportunity to serve God. And we will be held accountable for the times if we have not. I pray that each one of us 
will continue our lives glorifying God and praying for that day, not as a day that we should worry about, not as a day that we should be afraid when the master comes back home and say, I knew you were a hard master, so I've hid. But a day when we are rejoicing, saying, Father, look what I've done. Look what I've done with what you gave me. And we all hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Brent? Jesus, I surrender. Be standing, please. To him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily.
Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you've given us, the spiritual blessings you've given us. We pray that you'll forgive us where we fail thee and just help us have stronger faith, help us to use our talents for your glory and uh, for your kingdom. Help us to be an encouragement to one another and be with those of our number that are undergoing trials. Lord, comfort them and be with them and be with us throughout this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.